Hello, Mage fans. This is Mage the Podcast, the podcast where we work hard towards ascension so you don't have to. I'm your host, Adam Simpson, and today in Tomes of Magic, we're looking at the first edition Storyteller's Screen. This came out soon after the first edition core book, and I should have discussed it towards the beginning of this series, but I just got my hands on it for the first time a few weeks ago, so please forgive the late entry. This came out in 1993 and would have had a number two on the spine if it had a spine. Inside the Storyteller's Screen is an adventure titled The Angel of Mercy. The screen is a trifold cardstock screen familiar to RPG fans since the early days of fantasy role playing. There's a decorative image on the outside meant to inspire the players, while the inside is three panels of reference information duplicated from the first edition core book. The first panel is charts for the magic rules, including quiet, that is a special mystic kind of insanity that only mages experience. Second panel is a summary of what each sphere can do at each level. These listings are so sparse that I don't consider them terribly helpful. The nine sigils for the spheres are shown at the bottom of this panel. Is it that important for a storyteller to sketch them during play? I've never had to do that myself. The third panel is for combat information. More than half the page is for guns. Some may find this overkill, but during the 90s, a lot of World of Darkness fans were teenagers who wanted epic battles in their game sessions, so I don't find this out of place. As an adult, I don't care much for details on guns. The difference between a 9mm and a 45 do don't seem that important to me. However, I remember gaming when I was a teenager, and most of my friends thought the details extremely important. Palladium Games was selling a lot of tabletop RPG books in the 90s, and they had many, many pages of details on guns. I want to take a moment to discuss the screen's image. This was done by David Martin, and it's a doozy. No, doozy is an understatement. This epic battle captured on three panels will change the way you see Mage. I remember seeing it on the store shelf years ago and thinking, this is over the top. Way over the top. (laughs) I didn't buy it when it came out because I didn't feel like I needed it. I've seen low-resolution versions of it online over the years where people use it as proof that Mage the Ascension is a wild, out-of-control game. Can't say I disagree, but then that's why I like it. The image depicts a technocracy attack on a Council of Nine Horizon Realm chantry. Some chantries are on Earth, some are in Horizon Realms that were built by mages in the Umbra. This is not any particular chantry from the books. In the early days of Mage, the Technocracy's pogrom was in high gear, and shutting down council chantries to steal their nodes was the order of the day. However, I have to pause here to share a complaint. This image shows a full-on attack against the chantry in the Umbra. We learn early on that the Technocracy's tactic is to send void engines, that's a high-tech Uh, technocracy vessels, to invisibly attack the nodes on Earth. They cut the flow of quintessence to the Horizon Realm and then wait for the Horizon Realm, along with everything in it, to collapse. So what happened here? Did the technocracy get so mad they said, screw it, we're attacking this chantry right now? Or did the artist think this would look more dramatic? It's hard to say. But back to the image, the observatory dome in the lower right and its surrounding buildings are the Chantry. On the left, we see the Vile Technocracy. They're employing five high-tech air bikes with guns mounted on swivel turrets. The main vessel is a steel ship that is made up of elements from different eras of seagoing vessels. It has sails and rigging from wooden ships of hundreds of years ago, along with Viking shields mounted on the side. Why are the Technocracy using Viking shields in 1993? You ask too many questions. There are large pods along the sides that house torpedoes or perhaps inflatable life rafts. No weapons mounted on the deck, but energy cannons poke out of the side of the hull. This doesn't match the umbral vessels we read about the Void Engineers using in the first edition core book, but hey, maybe the Void Engines were in the shop. On deck, we see three vicious servants of the Technocrats firing machine guns. One is a furry mutant probably created by the Progenitors. It has a reptilian fin on its head, and it's wearing a snappy suit and tie for some reason. We see a punk rocker rocking his 80s spiked mohawk. There's a chap dressed like a soldier out of Japanese or possibly Chinese antiquity. Would someone tell me what he's doing here? The technocracy are not that into historical recreations. Commanding the raid on deck is the cool, collected technocrat smoking a cig and sporting an eye patch and pirate earring. He's too cool to wear a shirt, but not too cool for a long ponytail. I think he's modeled after the Nick Fury character from the early years of Marvel Comics. Next to the leader is a little boy. He's agitated, and the technocrat is touching his shoulder to reassure him. What is this kid doing here? A new recruit? They're showing the ropes? This just doesn't make sense to me. 
On the right, we see the Council of Nine defenders springing to action. We see Dante with his VR glove stepping through a magic portal. Do virtual adepts usually fight in person on the front lines like this? Is this Dante's style? Perhaps I missed that memo. We see a woman who's hijacked one of the air bikes and is using magic to levitate and fire several machine guns at once. If that's a rote and not spontaneous magic, I know several players who will get in line to learn that rote. Finally, we see the mage with a katana and Japanese kimono depicted several times in the first edition core book. This character isn't named, and I'm pretty sure this is the last time we see him. He's probably meant to be an Akashic brother. Another detail here, the kimono he's wearing is a woman's kimono. In 2020, we're free to wear whatever we choose, but in 1993, a Japanese person stepping off the plane from Tokyo and seeing this would ask, why can't he get a man's kimono? It would certainly match his combat boots better. Behind all this carnage, we see... Two white spectral dragons roaring at each other. I think this is supposed to represent the titanic forces being roused because of all the sphere magic being used during the battle. No matter how you feel about this image, it certainly made a splash in the world of RPG fans. The second edition storyteller screen was much more subdued. For another view on this screen, here's Terry Robinson. Hi, Mage fans. This is Terry Robinson with Mage the Podcast, and I'm going to talk about a storyteller screen. Before we start, I think it's kind of important to lay down a reminder of what Mage the Podcast is. At the end of the day, Adam and I are both celebrants and critics of Mage the Ascension. It's a game we've both spent a lot of time with, and we love it. If we didn't love it, we wouldn't have played it for so long. Now, in the hierarchy of Old World of Darkness podcasts, there are different degrees to which podcasts are celebrants versus critics, and I'm not saying one is better than the other. At one end of the spectrum, you have Midnight Express, where BK has an uproarious joy over seemingly every bit of esoterica and loves it to a degree I wish I could bring to bear on literally anything in my life. Uh, People in the audience, find someone who loves you as much as BK likes talking about the Hem Kasobek. Again, like 95 minutes of podcast on like eight pages of material. It's fascinating. And on the other end of the spectrum, you have, um, I will change their name to protect their identity. You have Mosh Beef of Swearwolf, the podcast, who I think has liked four books in total ever written for the line. Mosh Beef brings us amazing insights about Swearwolf, and we super appreciate that, and it helps all of us play better. And that's fine. That is that person's relationship with the game, and we all have a different one. Now, I think Adam and I are something like 30% critic and 70% celebrant, plus or minus 10%. But this storyteller screen is going to try both of those. Now, let's start with the basics. The inside of the screen is three panels, as is the outside. It would be pretty impressive if it were otherwise. And it is guns and spheres and quiet. And if a storyteller screen tells you what the game thinks you'll be doing, Mage is a game about guns, sphere magic, and quiet. I mean, there's additional charts for, like, the gauntlet or health levels and what they do or how armor affects you. But that's those are just kind of extensions of the gun spheres and quiet trinity, as I will refer to it. And it's not bad. Uh, the thing about a storyteller screen for a game that just came out, you don't know what the game's going to be. So you're not quite sure what needs to be presented. But if you need to know what the different stats are for an SMG large versus a SMG small, it's right here. And I've always been curious how much ammo a Mac 10 can carry. And overall, I think Mage pays way too much attention to guns as an idea. I think we should just break guns down into like small, medium, and large and don't really care about the other stuff. But that's that's me. We also get a table of firefight complications because this thing is about guns, spheres, and quiet. The quiet chart is pretty detailed. It gives you a list of quiet effects ranging from Paradox 0 to Paradox 10, and it kind of suggests to me that the authors thought that the storyteller would be constantly changing the world based on what your Paradox rating was. And I think that's entirely fine. It's a huge lift, and I wouldn't wish that on anyone, but hey, that was the game. Now, 
that's the inside. And honestly, I think most of the stuff in here is, is kind of useful. I wish the sphere effects had a little bit more detail. There's really no reason they couldn't have added a little bit more. And the sphere sigils are, are cute as just a reminder, but I don't know about you. Every time I try and freehand a sphere sigil, I, I look like a crazy person. It looks like I missed sphere day in elementary school and I just wind up with something that looks like an A on heroin or the number four uh, that decided to go to college or something like that. I guess maybe with the exception of spirit where it looks like I put a derpy eighth note inside of a rectangle. Um, don't get me started on life or mind. But now we get to the front. And this, this is glorious. I will try and paint you a word picture. It has the standard velvet Tyrian purple background about it. And as we found out in our interview with Rich Thomas, that velvet background is actually a scan of his grown daughter's velvet wedding dress for Rich Thomas's wedding. And then going about it, we have a scene where various men, and they are all men, save seemingly one in an ambiguous monster, are shooting each other. Uh, and not just shooting each other. We talked about guns, spheres, and quiet, and this has all of them. Now, I say men, and I am making assumptions about how the characters are expressing themselves. There appears to be one person who I would stereotype as being female, but um, I look at this and immediately think of Scorpion's Here I Am Rock You Like a Hurricane. There is some sort of anthropomorphic mobster raccoon that has an automatic weapon that's shooting it. I'm not entirely sure what, and he could be a manifestation, or she. I'm just assuming because there's a tie. But the interesting thing even about the tie is the little bit of the tie that goes on the bottom is longer than the part on the top. So I'm going to assume that's the quiet part of it. Behind him, there is what I can only call a pederast syndicate pirate who has a sword and a cigarette, which you probably couldn't include in a modern game to probably violate some like parents advisory council shit, uh, who is telling a child, uh, no, no, Timmy, don't go towards the swarm of guns. Stay immediately next to me and not behind me where it's safe. And this child seems very alarmed as a child in a space gun battle should be. And there are one... To, there are two Mohawks present, and all the people present have impressively long hair, except for one figure in the back who looks like some sort of cyborg proctologist who is stepping through a door next to someone on some sort of space scooter. It looks like a lady is holding a gentleman captive or trying to decapitate him while simultaneously psychically controlling several guns. We don't know who is in charge of those guns. And then off to the side, there is possibly the whitest man in existence wielding a sword, probably a katana, because they're in something that looks like a kimono. Now, we are familiar with the trope of the trench coat ninja. And I think it's time that we broaden that to other combinations, uh, such as the, uh, the Wakazashi business suit combo. And this person appears to be opting for the uh, katana. Plus it looks like they stole a bathrobe from not necessarily a high end spa, but a medium end spa. The real thing that comes across to you is how thick the material is. I don't know if that's, part of the guns, the quiet, or the sphere magic portion of that. So I guess that's left to the imagination. The interesting thing is this gunship seems to be attacking a telescope. There is a large telescope dome, which you assume it's a cannon at first because everything else is kind of on fire or being shot about, but it's a telescope and the pirates are destroying it for reasons I don't fully understand. There's a lot of lightning in the background, and there's a dragon howling at another dragon. You would think they're fighting, but in that they don't have guns, I have no concept of whether or not they are. Now, the man and woman 
on the flying space car with the psychic guns hovered about them. There seem to be two or three or four or... Wow, there's a lot of them. There appears to be at least five of these vehicles about. I don't recall them ever being mentioned in any of the books. So I assume that maybe an M5 will finally get closure on that. And these people are, are scooting about. They all have guns on them, but the only two that appear to be discharged is one person that has no visible rider and another one that also has no visible rider. So maybe it's some sort of metaphor where you have to ride them to prevent them from killing people. And then maybe if you ride them, you die. I'm not really sure what's going on here. Now on the pirate spaceship, we have a fellow with very impressive glasses and a mohawk and another person with bare armed armor i mean just a standard man bun i guess i mean uh, it's kind of a pre-man bun because the bun in the back hasn't been put up but overall it's uh it it looks like kind of a toms of finland vaguely asian uh, space pirate vessel again plus a little hint of pederasty and a space monster who may or may not be male i'm not entirely sure with a wacky tie uh, trying to destroy a telescope and space bikers with psychic levitating guns attempting to stop it. Uh, if that does not perfectly tell you what is on this screen, I don't know what will. Maybe there's a story behind this. I just don't know. But would I recommend someone buy this? Ah, many of the effects have changed. Many of the sphere damage charts have been updated. Quiet has been fundamentally modified. The front art isn't really anything to, to write home about, but boy howdy, is it a fascinating time capsule into early mage. I think my favorite part, though, is the fact that on the front, there is very clearly the little stencil for the White Wolf Game Studio. And that little paw print is on more than 400 volumes of works behind me, as well as the location of the office they no longer have. There isn't even a right here for more information or a web page or anything like that. Just a bold statement of this is who we are. And if you have a question, come ask us at work. Let's turn now to The Angel of Mercy, the adventure that came with the screen. This was written by Sam Chupp and developed by Ken Cliff and Brian Campbell. It's 16 pages, but two and a half of those pages are taken up with character sheet and basic rules charts. I can't help but notice the Paradox Catatonia chart. How many of you listeners keep that chart handy when you're running mage? A while back, I had an episode where I discussed published mage adventures. I left out the adventure Alien Avatar from Transmissions from the Rogue Council and the material from Ascension because they were tied to the metaplot of the Revised Era. I left out Angel of Mercy because, at that time, I didn't have it. This adventure is the first published adventure for Mage. I'm not counting All Hallows' Eve from the back of the first edition core book because it was quite short and given a full treatment in Luma Fate. There isn't a lot of artwork in this, but I'd rather like what's here. One thing the art makes clear, if you're going to be a mage, you need a submachine gun. The story revolves around a marble statue that houses a powerful demon and renders it inactive. This statue is the centerpiece at an indoor shopping mall, and an Afondus wants to release it. As the players try to deal with the situation, the technocracy steps in and complicates matters. The story has two chapters and a total of six scenes. It's a short adventure, and if run as intended, would require very little preparation on the part of the storyteller. You could probably run it as a one-shot, although I think it would be rushing things. I'm guessing I'd spend maybe three or four game sessions on it if my players stayed on track. The introduction assumes the Mage Chronicle will take place in one city. This was a common assumption for World of Darkness Chronicles back in 1993. Vampire predominated, and that style works well here. Even though the plot doesn't hinge on the technocracy, it's assumed they will play a large role. Early first edition had the technocracy's pogrom in full effect and assumed the technocracy dominated large cities, so even when the players deal with other matters, it's just assumed the technocracy will be a factor in any story. There are ten different suggestions for hooking your player's interest, one for each tradition, plus hollow ones. Worth mentioning is the link between the Nefandi and the neo-Nazi groups. We see this again in the first Book of Madness. The Nefandi here 
uses Odinist magic, but it seems clear to me that the author meant a corruption of Norse rune magic, not a traditional practice, which would be more in the Verbenus territory. I noticed one spot where a perception plus awareness role would tell a mage if an NPC had, quote, signatures associated with the kindred, end quote, that is, vampires. This includes flunkies employed by vampires. I'm pretty sure mage storytellers today wouldn't handle things the same way. Page 8 gives us a sidebar for paradox zones. These are places where paradox energies are stronger. It states the reason paradox is stronger is because there are more paradox spirits present in the background. It mentions crime and accident scenes and anywhere video cameras are installed. Paradox zones are rated with a number that indicates how many paradox dice are rolled whenever a magic effect of any kind is used. Every one from the paradox dice result affects the magic roll. This makes paradox more likely to occur and more likely to be messy. I don't recall seeing paradox zones after this. I think mage writers and mage fans prefer to use zones that favor a particular paradigm rather than making all magic more risky. However, I'm not eager to throw paradox zones out. Using one in an earthly chantry that is having unusual trouble or in a particular spot in the penumbra will not only make for a surprise for your players, but make them want to investigate the cause, which can lead them into interesting things you have planned. For those new to mage, the penumbra is the spirit reflection of the physical world and a departure point for going deeper into the umbra that is the spirit world. Although the adventure has a number of things going for it, I probably wouldn't run it at my table. The adventure runs along simple lines and doesn't explore the interesting corners of the mage setting. However, I won't judge this adventure harshly because it had a job to do, and I think it pulled it off. This was the second mage product and was meant to be used by new storytellers. All mage storytellers were new at that point, but it was also for people running RPGs for the first time. It's simple and straightforward. It avoided the difficult aspects of mage, like the umbra, chantries, quiet etc. It occurs in a city where World of Darkness fans are comfortable. It's short and doesn't require a storyteller to be familiar with Mage's unique setting. 14 pages of reading and it's time to start with your players. It assumes scenes and events will occur in a certain order, but because it's short, this isn't difficult to do. Loom of Fate is more versatile, but it requires more from the storyteller. If I was talking someone into being a first-time Mage storyteller, I'd hand them Angel of Mercy. I like how it offers advice on using the technocracy in a more nuanced way. In the early days of Mage, many storytellers ran a fight as a natural result of technocrats appearing on the scene. Angel of Mercy has the technocrats show up in a crowded mall where they have to avoid making a splash. The adventure makes them harsh but gives suggestions on how they bargain with the players rather than attack them. There are nice suggestions for extending play. Whether the players thwart the attempt to free the demon or not, there are ideas for future consequences. There are suggestions for future stories that revolve around a reporter awakening, continuing to oppose the Nefandi, and other things. Although the story is linear, it avoids being a railroad. Railroad in RPG terms is a story where the player's choices don't matter, or where they are forced to do certain things. Angel of Mercy has some flexibility built in. If the players run from the first fight or kill every opponent there, the later scenes still work well. I felt there could have been more suggestions to the storyteller for handling information gathering. After the initial scenes, the players learn something is up. They will probably attempt to research the gang they meet, the statue they hear about, or other things. The adventure is weak in this area. There's a small number of NPCs and places to go, but again, this is a starter adventure, so we don't want to overwhelm a new storyteller. I enjoyed the final page, where ideas are offered for a crossover with Vampire the Masquerade. Uh, Vampire was by far the most popular World of Darkness game at that point, and very well known. Uh, the other World of Darkness games were still rather new and just starting to catch on. The story takes place in a large city, so kindred involvement would be a natural fit for many World of Darkness fans. The storyteller could replace the Nefandi with a Sabbat with no trouble. You could even replace the Technocracy with the Camarilla to throw your players a curve. It mentions the Tremere, which is a clan of vampires that adapted hermetic magic to vampiric blood magic centuries ago. A great opportunity to place plot hooks for future stories. If you're thinking of running your first Mage Chronicle, kicking it off with Angel of Mercy is a great idea. It won't be easy to get your hands on it, though. It took me years. I used my podcaster privilege to buy a copy from a listener in the UK. In the future, I'll try to check my privilege. I've never heard of a PDF version. Drive-Thru RPG doesn't offer it at this point. I talked 
to a guy who looked for it in RPG pirate sites. He couldn't find it. I immediately told him not to go to online pirate sites. I found it on eBay for $25 and the Dragon's Trove for $18. Now that I've covered Angel of Mercy and described its potential use, let me explain the value of published adventures like this one and Tale Recursion and Deax Machina from Digital Web. Active and experienced storytellers may not see any value in using them, and I won't argue. However, new storytellers and storytellers coming back from a long break should take a serious look at these short adventures. Terry and I have been saying for some time that what we'd really like to see is more people running Mage. These adventures can help. Too many people intend to run Mage, but get stuck while planning the perfect chronicle or in research reading a stack of books. Some people get intimidated trying to understand all the parts of Mage's vast setting. These things aren't necessary. Not only are they unnecessary, but they can prevent you running a real game. A published adventure like Angel of Mercy doesn't require detailed knowledge or a brilliant plan. You can quickly start play and be confident there isn't much to worry about. When you're running a simple story, you deal with basic rules questions and handle your players. That's enough to take on at the start. You'll probably find there are sphere questions you hadn't considered, techniques for juggling your players you haven't had a chance to practice. For most of us, these are enough to keep us busy. Handling a complex story or special corner of the world of Mage at the same time might be too much. And think of your players. They may be new to Mage or out of practice. They need a few game sessions where not much is required of them. They need to get used to the rules, learn how to handle their character sheet, and get accustomed to each other. A simple story like Angel of Mercy is perfect for this. Once they feel comfortable playing their character and using sphere magic, then they'll be ready for more complex stories and opponents. Another topic to cover is age. Angel of Mercy is from the dawn of Mage, the early first edition when the rules were clunky and the setting was rather different than it is today. How can anyone think of running it today? Well, I don't think that's a real problem. Translating this to Mage Revised or Mage 20 is no trouble for someone who has read the court rulebook. Very little in this adventure needs to be altered. The differences in spheres between editions are not large enough to cause problems, and you may need to switch out one or two skills for an NPC here or there. The later scenes of the story take place in Angel Fountain Mall. Shopping malls still exist today, but they don't have the same import they had in 1993. Drop the mall and say there's a city park with the angel statue by a pond at the center. Busy shops surround it on four sides, and Michael Wellington, the mall owner, becomes the head of the Chamber of Commerce. The technocracy are not the all-pervasive threat in later editions that they were in first, but this doesn't need to be a problem. Even if the technocracy don't have an iron grip on every city in the Mage 20 era, all you have to say is the players discover there's a technocratic construct, that's a technocracy chantry, next door. The technocrats police their own neighborhood. Now that I'm on the topic of published adventures for Mage, I want to answer a question that came to us on email a while ago. Why aren't there more published adventures for Mage? One answer from Onyx Path Insiders is they don't sell well. I don't know the specifics, but low sales do tend to have an effect on things. Another answer is because they're hard to write, or rather hard to write well. This isn't just my opinion. Book of Shadows came out in 1993 for first edition. It was the first edition Mage Player's Guide. On page 203, Stephen Wick says, quote, Storytellers will quickly discover that the players will be capable of an incredible assortment of effects, even at low sphere levels. This alone makes it nigh impossible to plan a firm plot line for a mage adventure. It is impossible for a storyteller to predict every use of magic the players might concoct over the course of an adventure and then plan a storyline around it. Just try to imagine keeping mage players onto a linear plot line where the storyteller wants events X, Y, and Z to happen in order right after one another. The players will inevitably get to scene X and then perform some magical feat that makes scenes Y and Z meaningless and catapults the storyline in an entirely new direction." End quote. The Mage 20 Quick Start came out in 2014 for Mage 20, the current edition. On page 45, author and developer Satiros Brocato says, quote, Mage doesn't lend itself well to modules. Linear adventures that lead from scene 1 to scene 2 to scene 3 and eventually to a one-size-fits-all climax are alien to this game, end quote. These quotes could be used as evidence that Mage is a difficult game to write adventures for. So, are storytellers on their own? Write your own adventure or give up? No, I think coming up with your own stories for your players is fun, but if you're new and you need a little help or just want to try something different, there's the published adventures I mentioned, and you can go to the Storytellers Vault online and get adventures written by other Mage fans. I haven't had a chance to read through what's currently on offer there, but I'm willing to bet there are some gems. 
I've heard mage fans ask, why do fantasy role-playing games like Dungeons & Dragons have so many published adventures while mage doesn't? It's true that the current edition of Dungeons & Dragons, along with Pathfinder, the second most popular role-playing game for English speakers, according to many surveys, do have published adventures that are made up of consecutive scenes. The players are expected to do certain things in a certain order. There are two things to consider here. First, wizards in most fantasy RPGs aren't as powerful as they are in Mage the Ascension. They have a harder time changing the situation, especially at the lower levels, which most adventures are written for. Second, many of the older ad fantasy adventures are not actually written as stories. They describe a limited place like a dungeon or fortress where there's lots of stuff to do and lots of factions to meet. They don't expect any sequence of events. Players are free to travel through it any way they want, and if they skip sections, no problem. Not only that, the dungeons in those games weren't filled with hostile creatures like so many of us assume. They were filled with creatures, and the players made a reaction roll when they first encountered them. The goblins might declare the players allies, while the orcs might declare the players enemies. Reaction rolls meant not even the game master knows what will happen in the dungeon. In those old published adventures, the Game Master often ran the game not to tell his friends a good story, but because he wanted to see what would happen. What if you applied that idea to your mage story? Set up the situation, play some villains and some allies, now put in some wild cards. Social interaction roles, or just the events unfolding, can push these wild cards in any direction. If you want to see how things will turn out, that may be a good game session. Today, we call this kind of adventure planning a sandbox. Uh, sandbox is in the RPG term a place where different factions are represented and several things are going on. I think sandboxes are a great way to make a major adventure that can be published and used by different people. This is also a great way to prepare a few game sessions for your players. You don't have to think about what to do if your players get off track. There's no track. As long as you adjust a few things between sessions, you can use it for a long time. The potential downside of sandboxes is stretching believability. Why are so many powerful active beings so close together. In my experience, play players either don't notice or assume one of the events or mages they encounter is attracting the others. Also, once your players engage with one or more elements in your sandbox, you can avoid mentioning the others until the players get bored or you want to shake things up. In my own chronicle years ago, after a number of game sessions, the players learned there was a rogue cultist of ecstasy hiding in the city and trying to further his plans. During a game, one player said, so that's why there's so many mages in this city. Some are trying to get the rogue, while others are trying to take advantage of the turmoil. When I heard that, I thought, yeah, that does sound like a good reason. So I said, ah, yes, exactly, you are very insightful. This, by the way, is an example of why storytellers have a reputation for being shady characters. That about wraps up this episode. If you have something to say, please contact us at magethepodcast at gmail.com with your questions, comments, or feedback. Subscribe to Mage the Podcast on iTunes, Google Play, and TuneIn. You can follow us on Twitter, at Mage the Podcast. We're also on the web at magethepodcast.com. You can listen to past episodes there and see the complete show notes. This episode is thanks to executive producers Ira Grace, Richard Bat Brewster, and Michael Parker. If you would like to become an executive producer for Mage the Podcast, it would help us keep the lights on and keep producing episodes. You would also become a part of our own council to discuss upcoming projects. The link in the show notes will get you started. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Until next time, Towards Ascension!